the belief is that everyone has an idea in them that will change their life. Now, it may not be the next Facebook, but there will be a project or a product or a passion in everybody that will transform the way they think about themselves and will transform the way they experience life. There is nothing like making something happen that you care about to help you learn. It gives you an experience of your own power. It helps you realize what you're like when you're at your best and when you're at your worst. And it helps you realize the power you have in the world. For some reason, there are millions of us who are sat on the start line, not really doing it. Now, we were like this for, well, until I was 40, I wasn't making my own ideas happen. And I do a bit of speculating about why that might be in a moment, but there is nothing quite like it. This is us on our first day of big school. We didn't know each other at this point. Uh, and we were brought up to be employees, really. But I think it was the assumption that the goal was to do well in exams so you could get to a good university so you could get a job. And it was kind of the conversation at home as well over the kitchen table. My dad worked for Shell for his entire working life. He was there for 34 years and they looked after us. And so with the best intent, it was really the assumption that I would do something like that. And in a sense, when I thought about what I would do, it was who I would work for. Well, ultimately, we met here, Alex and I, we worked as consultants in an innovation consultancy called What If. It was our job to go into large blue chip organizations like PepsiCo, Samsung, and to help them have new product ideas. So we got really good at this, and we developed and learned a system for going in and to a deadline solving the problems involved in coming up with a new product that will fly off the shelves. And we really enjoyed it, but the irony was never that far away from our minds that we were just making other people's ideas happen, but we would eventually have to make our own ideas happen, and we knew this. And the good news is we did, but we wanted to think about why we hadn't made our ideas happen. What is it that stops people who clearly have the capability and the will and that sense that they have something in them that will transform the world, that will be their expression of their world view in the world. What is it that stops it and how can you unlock it? Well, here's three things, for me at least, that were stopping me. This is what we thought entrepreneurs looked like. Type A personalities, deal makers, no gray areas, completely certain about what they're doing, great hair. <laughs> and uh, we didn't feel like this, we've got okay hair. And we certainly don't have the confidence that we saw in these people as we were watching from a distance. And we were picking up these messages from usually television and it continues to this day this archetype five or six million viewers i think are watching the apprentice in this country all of us are drawing our own conclusions about what it means to make your idea happen they are tested for resilience told to be utterly competitive and focused on the dime that they are making and we're all sitting at home drawing our own conclusions from this if i was a tv producer i would be doing the same thing to make TV work, you need jeopardy, you need baddies, you need that transcendent success, the possibility of transcendent success, in this case where you are, it's almost like inconsistent parenting, I think, the dragon's den, where they kind of, they, they might love you, and then if they do, it's wonderful, and if they don't, it's terribly humiliating. But this makes great TV, you've got an hour to make business interesting. The, the sort of codes, the semiotics of this are such, I think, that people are interpreting for themselves what it would mean to go and make their ideas happen, how difficult how dangerous even it is to make your ideas happen. This is the US version of the Dragon's Den. It's a dangerous place, a shark tank. You don't get out of one alive. Now clearly, making an idea isn't all about that as far as the TV show is concerned, but these are things that we're interpreting and learning from. And it's not just on the television, it's also online now. I found these two articles, and these are two articles not a couple of months apart from each other, and the implication, my inference from this, is that there is a type. You're either one or you're not, which I now believe to be untrue. And the interesting thing as well is that I actually look down these and I see myself in both of them. You know, so we are drawing conclusions and it's because the internet works like this that these have been written like this. If you were somebody who was trying to get eyeballs onto your site so that you could make money from advertising, you'd be writing headlines like this. And so there's this kind of subtle kind of evolution of the message around this stuff, which I think is meaning that people like us and millions of other people, we think, are not perhaps going there because it looks too damn scary. Luckily, both of us found things that we really cared about that we wanted to make happen. And this is where mine started. This is my wife. 
uh, in a pink onesie on a round yoga mat in front of a green screen in the so sports and social club in the village where we live. She is performing a kids yoga adventure. So she uh, was teaching kids yoga in schools where we live and we, we wanted to scale this. She was so good at it, she was getting really good feedback from all the kids um, doing what she calls kids yoga adventures. So it's a story which is punctuated by yoga moves. You come to a tree and, and so on. So we decided to film them and we went down to our sports and social club and filmed three episodes. We then waited for six weeks after filming them because we were so worried that they were ridiculous and that people would laugh at us. And then finally we posted them. And this first one uh, is called Squish the Fish. It's now had a million and a half views. And since then, we've done 27 more episodes. And this kids yoga that Jamie does called Cosmic Kids is now done in schools all over the world. And we've developed a teacher training program as well with 600 students on it. And we do digital <coughs> downloads. And, but the point is, I still don't feel like one of those guys on the telly. I still don't feel like an entrepreneur, but I'm having a fantastic time. And it's building my confidence. And it's utterly changed my life since that moment. Alex has had a similar experience. He created an app that lives on your phone, which works as a, um, a loyalty, an online loyalty scheme for a, an independent merchant. So say you're a coffee shop on your phone, you go in and you ping your phone on the little noggle that's on the counter and it ticks over a visit, which means that you can reward that person with a free coffee for coming in three or four times that week. And he did this with his brother, started from nothing, and it's now a, uh, an IP business, so the actual noggle itself is something which is being sold around the world. The experience of all of this, so we, we had the technique that we'd learned from doing it for other people that we then used on our own ideas, and then we had the experience of what it feels like to make something. You don't know what's going to happen when you're making your own thing. It's a journey. It's tough, and we wanted to share what we'd learned from that experience. And it's a wonderful experience as well. And then we also went and um, <coughs> spoke to a range of creators, people in this country who were some way further down the line than, than we were in terms of making their idea happen. Mm -hmm. It's basically the stages that you'd need to take in order to make your idea happen, from getting your head straight to finding an idea that you care about, to getting it out into the world so it's not just something you talk about down the pub, uh, to building a fan base about, around it, and so on. For the next 10 minutes, what I'm going to talk to you about is how creators find and make their ideas. And what we mean by creators is essentially anyone who doesn't see themselves as that archetypal entrepreneur. And that's probably most of us in here. It's, cer it's certainly Martin and I. We are all in cre creators. In fact, we all create every day. If you compose an email, a tweet, uh, if you cook a new dish for dinner, you are, you are creating, essentially. Um, and this language is having real power. We've had people emailing uh, us going, I feel I can be a creator, I believe I can do this, I can make my idea happen. Let's get into this now. How do creators, how do people like you and I, how do we find ideas? Well, the first thing that we do is, is we look for them. Now, you can wait for your idea to come to you. Um, I would argue that is procrastination at best, uh, and it's an excuse not to start. You could wait a very long time. It sounds like a simple point, but the first thing to do is actually go and look for your idea. And actually, one of the quotes um, from Bill Bear Baggins in The Hobbit is, there's nothing like looking if you want to find something. And so it is of ideas, essentially. So what we would say, first thing, commit a period of time, three months, six months, to actively going out and looking for your idea. I'll talk to you in a bit about where to look, but that first principle is to go and look, to start to, to carve out time to do it. Next, uh, you should get in the habit of making, and by that I mean make anything. It could be creating a video of your holiday, creating a new dish, repurposing an old bit of furniture. That physical act of creating with your hands is so imperative here because what it does is it takes you from a bystander and it moves you closer to the action. You can then spot opportunity better because you're in the thick of it, so you can notice, what do I really enjoy here? You can also notice what do people really love when they experience and see your creations as well. The second important point is it puts you in a state of readiness. So should you find an idea, you're ready to do something about it. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. You're going to have to do a lot of making if you're going to make an idea. So get in the habit of making. That's the second thing. The third thing would be to know what you're looking for. Now, contrary to common belief, you're not looking for a business. So ideas rarely, in fact, probably hardly ever, arrive fully formed. They are little seedlings, so you don't yet know what they'll grow into. It could be a weed, it could be an oak. What you're looking for at this point is an invitation to explore. What are you really curious about? What do you want to spend your time doing? That's what the window is, that's what you're looking for. And a really good story to illustrate that 
is a story of a woman called Jane Needle Kurtick. I always get her name wrong. Quintig, sorry. And uh, about 11 years ago, she was a design student and she had to do a, an entry for her end of year show. And um, she was in the woodwork department at the design college. And the tutor was talking about kind of silicon sealant, which is like bath, you know, the thing you use to seal your bath for people who like DIY. And um, she was playing with that when she noticed this, which is, um, you can't see too well here, but they are kind of bits of wood, wood resin and extract, which was in the, the extractor fan that sucks all the nasty fumes out of the woodwork department. What she actually did is she thought, that's really interesting, even the smell and the texture of it. So she mixed it together with um, the silicon that she was playing with, and it created this ball of goo. She didn't really know what to do with it, so she left it on her desk and went for lunch. When she came back, this ball of goo had hardened to like hard rubber. And when she dropped it, it bounced right up to the ceiling. That captivated her. That was her invitation to explore. She wanted to know what could this thing be and what could it do. It wasn't a business. It was a ball of goo. Eight years later, that ball of goo became Sugru, which many of you all know, which is a moldable glue which can be used to fix nearly anything. She sold over five million packets. It's listed in Time magazine's uh, one of the 50 best inventions ever. So you're not looking for a business. You're looking for a ball of goo, your invitation to explore. So right. You're going to commit some time to looking. You're going to be in the habit of making. You now know what you're looking for. Where should you look? A very good place to start is by looking within. The temptation with ideas uh, and finding ideas can be that you feel you need to look outside. You need to be external. So what do other people want? What will make money? What will disrupt a market? We would say if you're going to find an idea you really, really care about and you're going to enjoy making, start by focusing and noticing what matters to you. That's probably a really good place to start. That could be, um, what, do you, what are you really passionate about? How do you explore that further? Is there something in your passion you can, you can find an angle on? Is there a big frustration you've got in your life? Is there a problem you want to fix? But in the case of this man, uh, it's a guy called Paul Sinton Hewitt, it was filling in a gap in his life. Something was missing in his life. So back in 2004, Paul was an avid runner and a member of a running club in southwest London uh, when he got injured. And so he felt, oh, look, I can't really go to a running club when I'm injured. And so he was really missing that camaraderie, hanging out with his friends who were the runners. And he thought to himself, why can't I just go to my local park? Why isn't there a community kind of local running event that's free? It's crazy. We've got all of these great spaces. So he decided to do it kind of almost straight away. That weekend, he put on a 5K run in Bushy Park, got permission, obviously, to do it, invited 13 friends down. Went really well. He thought, I'll do it next Saturday. 15 runners came next Saturday. It was called UK Time Trials then. We now know it as Park Run. 120,000 people take part every week at 700 events across 11 countries. If you start by noticing what you enjoy, chances are, like with Paul, you'll keep going because it keeps on giving because you're enjoying your journey. So let's pretend uh, that you have found your ball of goo, your little invitation to explore. What should you do next? Well, the first thing you should probably do is write it down. Now, it sounds like a really flippant and obvious point, but it's crazy how often this is forgotten. Whilst your idea is still in your head, it's essentially just a thought mingling around with what are you going to have for dinner or what's on the telly. You need to get it out of your head and into the world. This is like the fundamental first act of creation. It gives your idea form. There's a neat little trick for writing ideas down, which we'll share with you, which we use as innovation consultants. But it lets you write them down in a way where you can really understand their value and explore how to make them better. It's very imaginatively called the concept. Don't, don't blame us for that. We didn't, we didn't name it. But um, what it does really smartly is it forces you to get really clear about the constituent parts of an idea. The reason this is good is it stops discussions about ideas being binary, it's good or it's bad, and it lets you understand what's working, what isn't, what needs to be better. So you can tinker and tinker until you have a brilliant idea. The constituent parts are a headline. So this forces you to almost productize it, give it a name that sounds like a thing that people can buy. Again, this is an act of, of realness. The need, what is it doing for people? What problem is it solving in their life? As innovation consultants, this is the bit where we call it like the nodding dog bit. If we were talking to consumers, which is what big businesses call people, you'd want them to be going, yeah, oh, this, I, this is a problem I've got. You know, I really need help with this. The product detail and reason to believe is really important as well. This forces you to get very forensic about how does this work? How does it actually work? Very important for kind of ideas in the technology space as well. When there's a myriad of possibilities that your idea could do, you see it a lot with apps, it does everything. No, really, what does it do? And do I believe that and can I deliver on it? And finally, the benefit. So 
after all of this, how is it going to change the user's life? So look, let's pretend that you've done this. For two weeks, you've been tinkering with your concept, sharing it with people, getting feedback. You're at a point where you feel like it's really working. This is really good. I want to move to the next stage. What should you do? Well, you should make uh, a first prototype of it. Um, prototype is quite a loaded word. There's lots of language around this about minimum viable products and all this kind of thing you, you'll hear about. This is a really important phase um, because actually the risk can be that you pile into feeling you have to make a production ready version of your idea. So you spend loads of money on making a brilliant prototype. Actually, we'd say, and, and that's probably the entrepreneur mindset playing out again, we'd say at this point you're still very much in learning mode. You need to learn. You still need to learn a lot more before you even know what you're briefing in. So we say create what we call a, a version zero. This is essentially the very first version of your idea made right now with what you've got to hand, cobbled together, bodged, whatever language you want to use. The emphasis is on you being resourceful because you're going to have to be resourceful a lot over time. Uh, it keeps costs down and lets you stay free so you can learn. The very important distinction here versus like minimum viable products and whatever is this is as much about you as it is your audience. So if you make it yourself, you're going to notice, do you even want to do this? Because you might be doing it for years. Do you enjoy making it? This is as much about you as your audience. Um, and I'll tell you a quick story to, to, to really bring this to life. Um, she's a woman called Harriet Playdale Bouverie. Uh, and about three years ago, she was down the pub with some friends. And as you do, they got to talking about, how do you actually make marshmallows? This discussion, I don't, I don't actually know how you do it, this discussion piqued her interest. It's that invitation to explore again. When she got home that night, she thought, you know what, I'm going to do it now. I'm going to make some marshmallows. But what she, she loved that process of making it. And even more, she loved the reaction of people when they ate the marshmallows the next day. So much so that she wanted to keep on exploring. Three years later, her brand, Mallow & Marsh, is the UK's leading brand of marshmallows uh, and is stocked in loads of big supermarkets. The next point I want to make, the final point in this presentation, is probably the most important point of all. And it looms large in Harriet's story. And it is this, do it now. The best ideas, the best creative thinking mean nothing if they're not married with action. Without action, without you actually doing something, your idea will never happen. It'll stay in your head or stuck on the fridge. And if that happens, you and the world are robbed of its potential to create amazing positive change. And it reminds us of, reminds us of a quote we heard, which is, you don't have to be great to start but you do have to start to do something great. So do it now, start, don't put it off. Uh, and I guess the reason all of this matters is that we came to this very late in life and it's been such a transformative experience making our own ideas happen. Anyone can do it, it is open to anyone. I, I don't know you guys, uh, but I do know you have something amazing inside you that has the power to change not just your lives and maybe the world around you. So I'd implore you to not let this quote be about you. Alas for those that never sing, but die with all their music in them.